Hey everyone, welcome to Pop XP. And before the show starts, make sure to click that subscribe button and click the bell to get notifications when we go live and we upload awesome new content. And don't forget, if you can, make sure to share our stream on all your social media outlets. We appreciate it, and thanks for helping us grow the Pop XP channel. Hey, what's going on, YouTube? It's the Brain of the Name Freedom here now, Scala with Pop XP. <laughs> and welcoming Mr. Teen Sensation Billy Tucci. And we got good old, the true, actually, the true brain of the man frame, Mr. JC Vaughn. Mr. JC, how are you doing tonight? I'm okay, Niall, and thank you for asking. Hello, Billy. Hello, JC. How are you? I'm good. Niall, I think you got a little bit of a lag going on. Do I? Do yeah, just yeah, a little bit. Like broken up, Nile, for some reason. Like broken like, up guy now. Yeah, huh? like a little, little low res. Yeah, like a uh, lot of low uh, res. Pixelized. Uh, uh, look how clear JC uh, uh, and I look. You guys are crystal clear. Yeah, that's because I re that's because I restarted and delayed the whole show because uh, uh, I was having real problems signing on at first. Yeah, it's just a te technicality, I guess, huh? Yeah, you are breaking up a little bit. You know, you, you're gonna, you're, you're not gonna have to. You, you, you can't say anything tonight, then. Uh, you have to just look pretty. Should I be like the frozen Nile guy? You be the frozen Ooh. Nile guy. I think that works. The search Fantastic. for the Nile. Fantastic. Well, YouTube's been having issues. They were down the other night. I wonder if it's uh, since I'm, you know, producing this and broadcasting this. I wonder if I'm tied into that mix. I don't know. Hmm. It could pretty. be, or it could be somebody has something against you. Yeah, it, it could, could be. be. It's probably could be that Doctor Blevins guy. Well, there, there is that. There is that. There is that. Happens. Anyway, old Bean, how I, are you, my friend? I think I. I well, I got to tell you, uh, I, I've I've had a heck of a day, but uh, powered through it because I was excited about this show tonight. Yes. 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 This, is this show is a long mind. time coming, isn't it, Scala? Long time coming. Long time. Months. Coming. Months in the making. I would say I would say I years in the making, even before you guys ever started the show. Before I was born, yeah, and yeah, actually, probably because you're so freaking young. That's true. Right. We all hate you for that, Nile. What are you gonna do, man? It's just my so you and your sleep? young good looks. Yeah. Oh Jesus! And happy Even birthday there. to your beautiful bride today, Nile. Thank you, thank you. I did a uh, power birthday. You know, we got everything set. I threw her a Disney princess birthday party. That's nice. That definitely threw her for a, for a loop, a surprise. So here's my first boom mention oh. of the night. How's she doing? Oh. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Look at, you, look at that. That's a Scottish dude. I think we've kept <laughs> our I think we've kept our loyal audience waiting yeah. long enough. Yes, I think what we What do have. you guys think? I think I absolutely agree. so, especially this we've we've been waiting for months to to try to get him onto the show, and finally yeah. Nile did something to con him on. And now I, have no I do not think that our guest can be conned. I think that as a five-time New York Times bestseller, as the founder of Boom Studios, mm -hmm. yeah. and a nine-time Gem Award winner for best publisher for Boom Studios, Ross Ritchie isn't going to fall for any of that stuff. Heck no. How are you? Hey, hey. <laughs> gentlemen, gentlemen, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Ross, on. I'm really, I, I, I was really glad you're here. And when, when Niall told me you were coming on, uh, you know, it was usually he's calling like, "Hey, do you want to be on this week?" And I'm like, "No, no, no, no." Yes. Yeah, pretty much. That's pretty much how it happened. Well, you and I go back a bit. A little bit, man. A little bit. So I got a, I got a question for you to start things off. Thinking about the whole history of Boom Studios, when you were starting it out of your apartment, yes, and you had a, a certain cadre of creators that you had, had established relationships with over a period, and you're breaking out these early books, how much of your vision for what it could be is in the Boom Studios of today? Mm. Well, great. I would say this is what I always envisioned. Now, um, I think, in, you know, we have four imprints. And so there's Studios, which does um, Something is Killing the Children, uh, Once in Future, We Only Find Them When We're Dead, When They're Dead, not When We're Dead. And um, 
the uh, natural mistake, Seven Secrets, and uh, this upcoming Keanu book, Berserker. And so I always envision studios doing that kind of stuff. And that's always been sort of the focus and the objective. And then we've got Boombox, which is famous for doing comics for a predominantly female audience. And um, Lumberjanes is something that I couldn't envision. I mean, we've sold over a million copies all, all told through Lumberjanes. And that's something I could have never envisioned, but I was always interested in things that were different. And um, I was always interested in stories for people that didn't read comics. And so it doesn't surprise me that I did that, you know, because it's cool. And that's the sort of thing that I would be interested in. And um, Kaboom is our imprint for kids. And I definitely didn't envision going into doing comics for kids, but I grew up reading comics. The first comic I read was when I was six. So of course it's natural that I would think that you could do comics for kids. And by the way, back when we launched that imprint, everybody told us we were doomed. And that was a terrible idea. Yeah. And the quote was kids don't read comics. So, yeah, I, I, I know that I know that from our experience at Gemstone, when we launched the uh, the reboot of the Disney's before you guys had them, yep. that the other than Jeff Smith with Bone, the terrain right. was lit was littered with well intentioned people. And yep. I, I genuinely think when, when Steve Jeppy decided to do that, he he put a little crack in the dam that was stopping that. And I think that when you guys did that, a couple other people did some stuff. I genuinely believe that we're in a little mini golden age of comics for kids right now, thanks to you and, and a handful of other folks. Well, look, mm -hmm. I think it's I I think it's bigger than that. And I think we we see we're blessed now because when you walk in the front of a comic shop, you see a rack of kids' comics, right? And that didn't happen before, and that's there now. But the thing is, is I was like having a conversation with Paul Levitz probably like five, six years ago. And we were looking at Raina Telgemeier, her sales. And, you know, Paul's estimate at the time was that there was probably 500,000 people going into comic shops. So, um, you know, we knew that Raina was selling a million copies of her books. And what's so, that, yeah, what's that tell you, right? Well, Paul and I were like, oh, this is awesome. It's like, you know. I'm bad at math. Two thirds of the audience is junior high girls for comics. And now you see with Scholastic in the business, you know, the, the, the Jeff Smith, you know, you know, is diary of a wimpy kid. Is that actually a comic or is it a hybrid or like, what do you want? You know, I count it, but I don't hold on to that too tightly. So if right, you want sure. to talk that out, that's fine. But um, you know, the bone uh, recolored job that, you know, Scholastic did, you know, that had millions of readers. Yeah. And so, you know, and now New York book publishing, there is not a New York, a big New York publisher that does not have a division that is devoted to doing kids graphic novels. It's yeah, like, it really, it really is something else. Yeah, it's huge. So, now, sorry, sorry, go ahead now. I was going to say, Super Chat just came in, so I just wanted to read that so we didn't pass by it. It's from uh, Comics Exposed. Thank you for the Super Chat. You told Ross that the Keanu Kickstarter was genius. Ross, don't be intimidated by a bunch of keyboard warriors, Twitter trash, trying to tell you how to run your business. Do more crowdfunding and make that thing. I appreciate it, you know, to take a, a quick detour and talk about that. And you guys probably know more about the space than I do, but what's interesting Ah, uh, thank you, Collector's News, is um, the, uh, I don't really, well, this is a definition of terms. So when I hear the term crowdfunding, what I think is the crowd is funding the project, right? And maybe I'm being a little too literal there, but, you know, what we did with Berserker was we were using it as a distribution platform to sell a graphic novel to people that have never read comics before, which would be a Keanu Reeves fan. And the way that we laid it out was we we're going to serialize this comic book through the direct market, just like we would serialize every boom book. There's going to be a first issue, a second issue, a third issue, a fourth issue. And we generally collect in uh, fours. Okay. And it's a 12 issue series. So the idea is here's the direct market. Bam. We're going to do variants like we do. They're going to come out on Wednesday. Off we go. Okay. Then you go through those four issues and then you collect it into a graphic novel. 
that's the second window of uh, availability. And so comic shops will get the graphic novel in the second window of availability. And then bookstores get it in the third window of availability. And we all know, because we're super nerds in the business, that the graphic novels hit comic shops first and they hit the book trade generally like a week or two after. Yeah, thir 13 days in a lot of cases. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth window is mailing the graphic novel to the Kickstarter uh, audience. And so what we were laying out was we're going to publish this through the direct market just like we're publishing. Like that's our plan. We had pages banked, the whole thing. We were not relying upon Kickstarter to fund the project. What we were doing, and we were, and, you know, Kickstarter worked with us with this plan. What we were doing was we were using it as a digital way to reach, you know, like people understand on Kickstarter, they know what Kickstarter is. And it's like, oh, I just click here and bang. Right. And it takes care of everything like the 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 difficulty of going to Amazon because the forgive me, I'm speaking in fragments here for a second. The bottom tier of that Kickstarter was buying all three volumes. So there was no ability to buy volume one and you're done. OK, so our idea was if you hear about Keanu and you want the story, it's 12 issues. Right. There's. Right. Act one, act two, and act three. You can't, it's just like you can't, you can't, you can't buy one third of a movie. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And with people who don't read comics, that's how they think. They would be upset if they got volume one and it was to be continued. That's like a break of a promise. Right. And so that the way that we structured it, and I'm going to get kind of nerdy here for a second, is, you know, let's say the first graphic novel's $14.99. It might be $15.99, but it's some, it's 15 or 16 bucks. It's something like that. Okay. But like three times 15 is 45 bucks. And the first tier was 50. So we slightly upcharged it because we wanted direct market fans to go into comic shops and like, I could buy the graphic novel. If I'm, if I'm a, I don't want comic book fans to abandon their local comic shop and go buy from Kickstarter. I do not want that. Okay. We did not want that. Right. So we wanted to send folks, like if you're going to buy from Kickstarter, you're going to pay a little bit more and you're going to have to pay for shipping, okay? Which you wouldn't have to pay for in your local comic shop. And that way we could support the stores and the stores have been huge for us. I mean, we're, we're having one of our biggest years and it's happening during the pandemic. I mean, it's staggering, you know, and it's just, it's so exciting. They're supporting us in such a big way. And for us, you know, when the shutdown happened, it was terrifying, right? It, you know, yeah. I was talking to Diamond. I was talking to Jeppy. Like, it was brutal, right? And nobody knew, you know, even when you knew that, that they were going to turn the, spig the spigot back on, you didn't have any idea if there was going to be any fans on the other side of that. We had, we, we had, we had so many different areas of the country that were in different percentages of lockdown. Yes, that that you didn't you didn't do it. Um, we had gone we had gone from curbside pickup to supposedly nothing. You know there were a lot of shops that you know basically did their business by e by eBay and yep. by and by drop offs, yep. uh, things like that. But you didn't know you didn't know what was coming. You know I, I talked to one store that had uh, has a I mean a really great subscriber base like two hundred subscribers at their store, and but literally when they opened up and still pretty much to this day, it's the, the walk-in business is gone. If yeah. they didn't have the strong subscri subscriber base, they might be gone. Yeah. Well, for what it's worth, what I'm seeing in the retailer chatter that I have access to and what I'm hearing is that most stores are up. Yeah. So, and I'll tell you this, here's what was mind blowing was the first week back after shutdown, so again, let's get detailed and nerdy here for a second, okay? Mm -hmm. There were two weeks worth of books in the pipe, okay? One week's worth of books was at Diamond, okay? They just did not distribute them. Right. And then the second week's worth of books had been printed by the printer, and they were on the docks waiting to go, but they were not at Diamond yet, okay? And then the third week would have been books you printed. So... When the spigot got turned back on, they had to re-FOC that first week of books. And 
we're doing Brian Azzarello's book, uh, Faithless, and the sales for the same book went up 3%. Yeah, and we, the second week, our sales for books that we'd already FOC'd, we already had print quantities for, went up 8%. For, for some of our listeners or viewers, let's just say final order cutoff is the FOC we're talking about. Right. And it's so, just it's just it's just amazing. Um, we we of course during the lockdown when no new comics were coming out, we've seen and this is the Overstreet thing for me that we've seen a sustained volley in back issues. Yes, and we're not talking. We're not talking. On, and you're a collector too, so I'm sure you've you've spotted it. At we're least not talking. Of those sale fifty percent of those sales are me. Yeah, between the two of us, right? Yeah. I I I set it up so I got new comics every week, even if they weren't new comics. Yep. So I had a shipment sure. coming from somebody every week because I'm a junkie. But yep. yeah, but from the Overstreet perspective, you know, we delayed our publication for uh, six weeks. Yep. And we have blown through the price guide in in a pace that I have never seen. Spectacular! So yeah. good to hear. I saw you posting about that online. And so so now we come out of the other side. Sales are going up. And I go to the shop every Wednesday as religiously as I can to be able to see what's going on in the market. And what I saw was Marvel was not shipping during that time period. And DC had basically, I'm going to get this wrong, but they'd taken like a month's worth of books and spread them out over six weeks. And so I'm going to the store and there's not really anything to buy. Yeah. Right. So what I knew was James Tynan the fourth was crushing it on Batman. And there was this huge lead up to the punchline storyline and Joker war that was building. Okay. And we could see it. Um, all this fandom building for Tynan. And we had a Tynan graphic novel called wind that was banked in our back pocket. And I basically went to my team and I said, let's take Wind, which was going to be put out in November as a graphic novel, and let's chop it into individual issues, and let's serialize it and push the release of the graphic novel back. Let's parachute, let's halo jump this thing in, okay? And they said, yeah, that's cool, Ross. You can't submit it to previews. Get it through the previews process where it gets into the catalog, to retailers, get orders and come back in time. It's impossible. Okay. And I said, yeah, well, what if we just blow that off and don't even do previews? Let's just go straight to FOC. Let's just go digital. And that's what we did. I called up Tynan. I said, this is your project. So I'm not going to jam this down your throat, but here's my crazy idea. Let's serialize the thing that was we were going to release as a graphic novel and let's skip solicitation. And here's the punchline, James. We're going to have five days to market your book. Five Jeez. days. Oh, my God. Yep. <laughs> yep. But what I saw was retailers didn't have anything to sell. Yeah. Right? And James had all this heat on Batman. He had eyes on him that, in a way that, like, you know, 18 months before he didn't. Right? Yes. Absolutely true. And I knew that our crazy plan was the story itself. It's just so crazy it might work. Right. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> right. And that's what happened. So, so Billy, you and I kind of casually know each other, but we don't know each other, know each other. And just one thing that you need to understand is I am nuts. Like <laughs> I am crazy. Okay. <laughs> and, we should bring the Garth Ennis together next time. Then. Yeah. It, yeah. 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 Well, you know, some good times with him. Yeah. So the thing about it, you know, the, the joke at the company is the name of the company ain't whimper. Right. So, yeah. You know, we, we, we're the guys that, you know, I'm the guy that put the exclamation point at the end and in the logo. And, and, and I'm the guy who said, I don't know about doing that. <laughs> I remember having this conversation with you, man. It was one of those, one of those nights where, uh, one of those nights where you needed a quick press release. And then finally, after we were done, you were like, what time is it there? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a maniac like that. That's yes, for yeah. Me. He's but a, that's but the, but the whole thing. But the whole thing is that the the, the wonderful thing about your success is look, Niall is all crispy clear. Hey. Am I good now? You're yeah. so pretty. Yeah. Now you're not. Now you froze up. 
Yeah, if really? you see me kind of fidgeting in Nile, it's because we're having uh, some streaming problems on Nile's end and seeing things freeze up. But he's, he's, you're much, good. he's much clearer good. than he was. Hey, yeah. wait, My upload's close to 20, which is like ridiculous. Good, like ridiculously good so, speed. Hmm. Ross when saying he's saying he's crazy is he's not I think the thing the way to describe it is you're not going to be confined by the box, whatever the box is. You know, in, in terms of outside the box, you you grabbed a you grabbed a box cutter and got out of it a long time ago. I'm not real good with we don't do that. Mm. Yeah. I just don't I don't I'm the guy that will sit there and ask you questions about like I don't understand why don't you? Like, you yeah. know, so I'm always the guy that's figuring out, you know, what, what if we did it like this? And what if we do it like that? And what if we do it like, like the vast majority of my staff is designed to make me not do things. <laughs> so, so, uh, Ross, if I may, uh, you know, fortune favors the bold indeed. And how did you tell us if, if you can, you know, uh, how you started boom in your well, apartment, as you was, as Jeff was saying in, in yep. Los Angeles, 15 years ago, cause you're celebrating your 15th anniversary again yep. of those 15 years for nine of those 15 years, you have won diamonds, best publisher of the year award to the gem award. Yep. That's, that's astonishing. Thank you. So if you could tell us how you started, you know, the, the, the sure. kid, the young kid with a dollar and a dream and the hippie haircut. Oh boy. And, I was, uh, Billy, I was grunge, man. It, oh, you were grunge. Okay. That's grunge. That's grunge. <laughs> Careful, sir. That's yeah. I was, I, on. On. I was not a boomer. You so, are not, um, a not a boomer, even though I started a company called boom. Yeah. So, um, There's some so, irony. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know. So <laughs> I think so Jeff, I you're the only boomer here, Jeff. Yeah, well. You're the end you of know the I gotta say to that? Bite me. Fight. <laughs> wow. Wow. It's a dispute. Pop X. All right. So um, so I graduate from college. I go to LA. I'm gonna make it in the movie business. Uh, I'm working as a flunky and uh, freelance life is not for me. Not, not having a lot of fun sitting by the phone waiting for it to call. Yeah. I'm a lifelong comic book fan, big, big time, big collector. I go to a convention here in Los Angeles and there's a booth set up, um, by the way, for fun. Randy Martin, Laura Martin's husband is the one that put the show on out in Riverside. And there was this pop-up booth for Malibu Comics and they had this huge video running for this. This is, Jeff will love all this stuff, all these details. They had this video running for a comic book that they were doing for the Ultraverse called Hard Case. And it was an MMA fighter that they had cast as Hard Case and they ran it as a trailer. It's on YouTube, you can go find it if you want to. And so I, I'm a film school kid. And so I walk up to the booth and I go like, Wow, you shot that on 35 millimeter, not 16. Like, that's expensive. Like, how'd you do that? And the guy that's standing there sa says, how can you tell the difference between 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter? And I find myself talking to the director of the trailer. Oh, cool. And so we go back and forth and we're having a blast being big film nerds. And he says to, to the guys at Malibu, they, you should hire this guy. There he is. <laughs> I was Whoa, Niall, the Niall, Niall, thank, thank you. you. I was just about to tell you to put Dave's comment up there. That's great. Oh, look at that face. Look I at put that. it up. No, you Night. didn't. I didn't see. No, no. Anyway. Thank you, Dave. We apologize. Hey, hey. Cool. So um so basically they have this film division. They offer me a job. I'm kind of, I'm working as a temp. And so like, I got to go to, I don't know where I was. I was like, went in and said, I'm, I'm, you know, don't count on me. I'm out. And by the time I left and got, went to work at Malibu, when I show up for my first day at work and they're like, yeah, we don't have a film division anymore. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and you're working in marketing and my first response was, and and now, Billy, you can come in with the hippie talk. So, Billy, you don't know this about me, but I was the guy at your high school that was the painting and drawing guy. So okay. when I go back from my high school reunions, everyone's like, how's the painting career going? <laughs> right? 
So I, the way I got through my senior year was, you know, I'd made my grades and I knew I was getting into my college. And so I just blew off class and I just drew all the pretty girls in class. Nice. Well done. Well That's done. Smart. Well done. So, you know, art boy was my freshman year was painting and drawing major. And then I transitioned to film and I'm going to school in Austin and I got hair down to my shoulders. And let's just say when you come to me and you say, hey, you're in the marketing department, I go, what? Yeah. <laughs> but an artiste. But a boy, a boy needs to pay his bills. Yeah. So I uh, discovered, much to my fascination, that I actually loved marketing and it was a lot of fun. And so I ran uh, conventions from Malibu and uh, got to meet some Hall of Famers and legendary talents. And that was a, a trip of a lifetime, which I'll always be thankful and grateful for. And then Marvel bought Malibu and I s stuck around for a little bit after that. But I thought, you know, I probably need to get back to what I always wanted to do, what I came to Los Angeles for, which is to work in the movie business. And so I transitioned back to working in the movie business and I got into uh, the development end of things, which I was much more interesting to me. And I worked eventually, um, I worked as a reader for Arnold Schwarzenegger. And so uh, what a reader does is when Warner Brothers has a script that they are considering Arnold Schwarzenegger for and Paramount, <laughs> thank you, Dave. <laughs> I, I think it's actually Tom, but thank you, Dave. It's Tom. Oh. Yep, Tom is due. Um, I remember Chris Olm was in the job interview. Uh, but the... Um, but basically what a reader does is the script comes in from Warner Brothers and it comes with an offer of, of payment and the agent gives it to the reader and, the, and, and says, is this any good? Now, it doesn't mean that the agent doesn't read it, but the agent gets a second opinion. And quite often with material that is, doesn't come with an offer, the agent doesn't read it, right? The agent wants a barrier of like, is this worth my time? Because, you know, agents are getting submitted like 20 scripts a day. So I read Arnold Schwarzenegger's screenplays or material submitted for Arnold and sort of, you know, got rid of the chaff so that the best stuff would come to the top. Um, I tried to, it was a particularly funny uh, story that I would tell that I tried to um, get Arnold cast in the Green Mile and the Michael Clark Duncan role. It's true. You know, wow. I was like, we can rewrite this character. We can make him like a um, European immigrant who doesn't speak the language. And that's why he's being discriminated against, you know, blah, 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 blah. Because I thought it would be really good for Arnold to do something that was a little bit more literary. Sure. Yeah. So anyway, you know, believe it or not, I didn't see um, restraints and frameworks. Um, so... At the, at the same time, because I worked from home and I could read my own scripts um, and I could control my time, my um, when I woke up and went to bed, uh, that opened up time period for me to be able to option comic books as a producer and then pitch them to studios to be developed as films. And this is sort of contemporaneous with Blade and before the first X-Men movie when it's really, you know, kind of like you have to explain to people that the mask was a comic book and you have to explain to people that uh, men in black was a comic book and um, had some success with that uh, selling projects to studios, but nothing was getting made. And so it was very exciting to be able to um, develop a relationship with studio executives and producers and uh, really be functional there. But it was frustrating to not be making movies. You had, you had mage for a while, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Matt Wagner's mage was one of the comic books. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting a little bit older and it's time to really get to getting, as we say back in Texas. Mm -hmm. And, um, I decided that, um, well, I got, I got, a, I kept up with a lot of my comic book friends and Keith Giffen and I particularly struck up a, a, a fun relationship. And, uh, Keith called me up. So a little bit of a sidebar. If anybody enjoys the, um, Jaime Reyes version of Blue Beetle. Keith called me up and said, I'm doing Blue Beetle at DC and I need somebody to write the script. And I said, Oh, you should hire my friend John Rogers. He's a showrunner and a TV writer. And Keith said, He'd never work for the page rate. And I said, I'll call you back in five minutes. 
call John. He wants to write comics. Um, but so Keith calls me up and he says, I'm doing a book at image and I want you to write it. And I said, Keith, I'm not a writer. And Keith said, I'm doing a book at image and I want you to write it. And I said, Keith, I'm not a writer. And he said, I'm doing a book at image and I want you to write it. And I said, okay, Keith, I'm going to warn you one last time that I am not a writer, but I'm also going to remind you that you are my childhood hero mm -hmm. and I adore everything you do. So with this last warning, I'm going to accept the gig because it would be a dream to write a comic book for one of my favorite writer artists of all time. And when I suck, which is <laughs> going to happen, you can rewrite me and I will not get my feelings hurt because I know I suck and I'm not a writer. So uh, we did a book at Image called Dominion and Keith rewrote me and did a great job and saved the book uh, from oblivion. But I think we self canceled around issue three and um, that then Keith came to town for a convention and he pitched me on um, starting a comic book company. And he said, you should start your own comic book company. And uh, I thought he was insane. We were at a tiny little dive bar and we were just killing a pitcher of beer. And Keith, I noticed, was not drinking his beer very quickly. And he was making sure that he was pouring the pitcher into my empty glass as fast as he could. <laughs> and um, the next morning I woke up and I thought, you know, somebody like Keith Giffen, who, you know, had such a varied career and so much success and longevity is pitching you on starting a comic book company. You probably ought to listen. And so I called Keith up and I said, okay, I'm going to run with your terrible idea. <laughs> but here's the deal. Like for the first six months, Every new number one from Boom is going to be a Keith Giffen number one because I have no guarantee that anybody's going to buy anything, but I know that they know who you are. So they'll buy Keith Giffen comics. So if you go back at that early release, you know, they're just, it's just filled with Keith Giffen comics. And so I owe my career to Keith absolutely 100%, um, and who's been incredibly generous. And, you know, now I've got Paul Levitz as a mentor, who's been my mentor past seven, eight years. And to sit here and think about the great darkness saga yeah. guy have had yeah. my life and changed it. You know, I'll, I'll be it, forever. I, I think, you know, you, you, you having him as a mentor and I've just been privileged. I, you know, every one, well, pre pandemic, every once in a while, Paul and I would go to lunch together and I'll drop him a question about this or that. And it's just, just to be able to ask guys like that. And Jim shooter, uh, the, 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 the knowledge out there that we get to glom onto is amazing. And I know you're somebody who takes it and runs with it. Oh, I do this thing with Paul where I call him up and I go, Hey, can you imagine if you called Galactus and he picked the phone up? You didn't go to voicemail. I mean, that's what it's like calling Paul Levitz. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I mean, Galactus? not to mix, not to mix our Mel use here, but wouldn't it be dark side? Well, <laughs> I prefer Galactus because I don't think Galactus is really evil. He's just he's, hungry. He's just hungry. Right. He's just hungry. He's hungry. Dark side is. Yeah, he's, he's no question. Dark side's a bad guy. Any anybody that gives Jack Kirby retroactive royalties is not dark side. <laughs> hey, before these time out, real quick, we've got three super chats for you. Um, yeah. Let's see. We've got uh, Comics Exposed just asked, "Who's drawing Berserker for Boom?" I heard that Garney isn't drawing it. Is that true? Well, maybe you know something I don't, because Ron Guardian is Ron. <laughs> maybe it's hey Ron, are you breaking news to me? <laughs> Did you do a super chat to give me some bad news? Maybe Comics um, Exposed has the has com Oh, that's the name Comics Exposed. Maybe he's exposing something here. Ooh, uh, he has another super chat for you. He says also, why didn't you crowdfund on Indiegogo after the Kickstarter ended? Oh, it's good. Yeah, it switched over to their in demand. I don't even know what that is. Indiegogo. <laughs> No, I, I mean, I, I understand what Indiegogo is, but I don't understand you were like the something. I'm sorry, Niall, you referenced something. Oh, but, uh, he, uh, what you do is you can take your Kickstarter and then transfer it over to Indiegogo. Okay. Yeah, there's a link to it, and it would be yeah. in Indiegogo. And they're, they're, the in, they're, 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 a, they're after the fact thing is called in demand there. But yeah. you guys have a, you guys like have an after the fact thing going on, though, though, don't you? You can still get it. Yeah. yeah. There's a, yep. Yeah. And then we've got one more here, and this is uh, V Extreme Storm Production. How would someone go about sending a pitch? Yeah, Ross, put are, something are those, in there as a fan. Are those videos that you did recently, are they on YouTube? 
Uh, I'm, I'm transferring them over to YouTube so you can check them out there. So when you go to YouTube, don't search for Boom Studios. Hang on. Always search for Boom Studios. But these videos you will find under my name, Ross Ritchie. Mm -hmm. And um, they are ported in from Instagram. So I would tell your audience, number one, I launched a YouTube channel this week. So go check it out. I'm interviewing James Tynan IV. Uh, it's a part one of a two-part interview where he talks about breaking into uh, comics, breaking into write DC comics. The second part of the interview is going to be him writing Batman. Now, um, I ported over these Instagram videos that I were doing. It was like three minutes, six minutes long, talking about breaking into comics. So I'd really encourage your audience on Instagram, I'm Ross underscore Richie, and that's R-I-C-H-I-E. There's no T, no E-Y. So uh, go over. I can see people are subscribing on my phone right now. Uh, so thanks for the for subscribing. But the um, but basically the Instagram, I'm doing these short video content where what I'm doing is I'm talking about um, how to break in as a writer. So. The analogy that I would use is you don't go to an NBA basketball game in the bleachers and come down and go up to the coach and say, put me in. Right? Yeah, not anymore. <laughs> and, and in particular, a lot of times people will say, hire me to write comics and I'll do it for free. You know, and I'm like, I don't want people to work for free. I want everyone to get paid. I want everyone to do really well, right? So we can all high five and be happy when we see each other. And so the thing that I would say, oh, thank you, Dave. Really appreciate that. Means a lot. Um, the Dave thing about some it, commas. <laughs> I'll let you uh, copy edit him. So I, I'll publish it once you're done. So the um, the thing about breaking in as a writer is that um, you know, now we'll talk about crowdfunding for a second. If in 2005, when I launched Boom, if Kickstarter, Indiegogo, I don't care what platform, any of that existed, I would have utilized that stuff to the hilt. Um, mm. It's mind blowing, like yeah. what you can do now. And, you know, I think there was web comics, but I was probably unaware of them. If there were web comics, I would have done that. Because the thing is, is proving that you have the talent when people don't know who you are is the whole game and attracting an audience. The thing about the Kickstarter stuff is, you know, you can raise money to get paid to pay an artist and be able to print the book. And as you're doing it, what you're doing is you're building skills. And so there's the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours rule and Malcolm didn't come up with it. He popularized it. And you can Google that if you're unfamiliar with it, but it's basically, it requires 10,000 hours to be good at anything. And what I counsel um, people that are trying to write for the first time or break in as a comic book writer at Boom is we cut our line 13% in 2019. And then when COVID hit, when retailers were really terrified, we moved 10% of our release schedule back. So aggregate between two years, we've cut back 25% in publishing. Now, who do, who are we publishing? Well, we're publishing James Tynion IV. We're publishing Kieran Gillen, Tom Taylor, Al Ewing. Like, you're competing with them. Yeah. Yes. Right? So if I was competing, I don't want to be playing basketball against Michael Jordan. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, I want to be... You know, I want to be in a place where I can differentiate myself. I can put a project out. It can be successful. You know, if I'm going to crowdfund, I'm going to put it at 3000 I'm going to do five grand. The next one, I'm going to put more weight on the bar. I'm going to go to 10 grand. I'm going to build an audience. I'm going to build an email list, right? Then I'm going to yeah. transition to, you know, you look at these publishers, SourcePoint or Scout, I don't know these guys. I don't know Bupkis. So it maybe your audience knows them. Maybe they don't. Maybe they like them. Maybe they don't. I don't know. I see a lot of activity and that's great. I see a lot of energy. I see fandom. People are excited about it. And you go and transition from maybe you stay at 
you know, I could have built a nice little career off of crowdfunding and maybe I'm such a maverick, I maybe would have never wanted to go in the direct market. But mm -hmm. you can transition into the direct market at some of these really exciting publishers, you know, and then you look at folks like Vault. Vault is so much fun and so cool. And those guys are great. I don't know them. I've really never met them. I've only heard great things. But it's like, now you're building your skill set and, you know, you're getting your 10,000 hours and then you're getting to that place where it's like, you know, maybe you're, you know, Marvel hires a lot out of that pool. Yes. You know, I so, think, I think how does it work though for like a licensed property though? Say like you got like you know, those guys out there that, you know, love, let's say like Power Rangers. Cause that's a huge yeah. uh, book you produce. Say you got like a fan out there that wants to like, write power rangers comics i mean is that are they, how do they even is that just something they can do on their own is is there any submission thing if they wanted to do that well you know that's probably the single biggest question that i get mm -hmm. is how can i write power rangers comics and my response is a little ridiculous. I picked a good one then <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> absolutely and my response is a little tongue in cheek but it's also a little serious which is ryan parrot is doing a really good job and i would really not I like to not have to murder him. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know? Like, what what why do you hate Ryan Parrott? Right? He's crushing yeah. it. And you're asking for his job. Right? Yeah. And so I think that I don't know how to answer the question, like mm -hmm. relative to you want to write Power Rangers comics, and I understand, and that's cool. I want to write Micronauts comics, right? The and Marvel Micronauts with, with all their characters too, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And, but at the same time, it's like the job's taken and the job's taken by a guy that, you know, I think between Mighty Morphin number one and Power Rangers number one, we're around like 180,000 copies. So, you know, it's doing, doing really well. So. Uh, Blevins called me out. He called me out on it. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> this sounds like something between you and Brian, Mile. I will stay out of this. Brian, Brian's one of the producers on Pop XP. And I think we need to extra make sure that Hasbro never sees this. <laughs> That's so. just all sorts of disturbing. Thank you mm -hmm. very much for that vision. You can just rock me to sleep tonight. Okay. So I want so, I want to I want to I want to ask a little drill down on that, Ross. Well, so go ahead great. and finish, well, please. Well, look, I just want to respect the fans and make sure on the breaking in conversation that we all feel like we've covered it enough because there's a lot of knowledge on the stream right now. And I think what I'm seeing, okay. So that that's, thank you for that response. Um, because I want to really take the, take the question seriously and give a in-depth answer because I started to kind of fire up the Instagram about a month ago. And what I saw was that I don't think a lot of this knowledge is being passed, passed on nowadays. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of questions that I think the four of us think are very obvious, I don't think are to the next generation of fans. I, so I, Ross, I, that's exactly what I was going to get to. Thank you. I, I absolutely think that there's two things going on. One, there is that tendency to think everybody knows. And usually when you get to that thought, it's, it's, it's immediately not true. Yep. And the other thing is that we are... It's an it's an adjunct to Hollywood culture of many people don't want to be the person who says no. Mm -hmm. And they don't tell you truthfully. They the people shine them on. And and it's not meant maliciously, but it has that effect of giving false encouragement, giving a false lay of the land to somebody who might respond appropriately if you told them how tough it would be. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, it's difficult with creative people because you want to be encouraging. And, yeah. and creative people need encouragement. You know, I'm married to a writer. She's a screenwriter. But, mm -hmm. you know, the number of times that I've had to pick her up off the floor, you know, after a particularly tough notes conversation, mm -hmm. you know, and that's understandable. So you want to be supportive of creative people, but they, but you also need to be firm about what the realities mm -hmm. of the situation are. And to cycle back around to the show I'm trying to do on YouTube, how it's designed and who knows if anybody's going to care, okay? So maybe I got the, the bad idea, and I got a lot of bad ideas, okay? So no pride of authorship here. But the idea is I've taken a two-hour, 20-minute conversation with Tynan, and I've 
cut it in half and it is slow and granular and it is detailed talking about where did you grow up? What was the first comic book that you read? When did it really bite you? Like when you started off as a writer, you wanted to start off as a novelist. So when did you make the transition? Why did you make the transition? You didn't have access to a comic book, comic book store. So how did you read comics? Like it takes us like an, you know, probably 45 minutes to start to head towards DC comics. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, and part of my spirit with that is, you know, it's the, the four of us know the business really well. And what I wanted to do is open the door and the sort of conversations that we have over dinner that fans don't have access to, you know, have that be something that fans can see. Cause you don't have time on panels to get into that. You're going to push whatever book is coming out, which you should be doing right. And the fans are interested in, but here's something that you can put online. It could be there in perpetuity. It is, it is, it is a passionate fellow fan. Cause let's face it. That's how you started. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, uh, they still am. with with a seat with a, with now with seasoned experience, taking a caring, sincere but serious and relatively blunt. Uh, well, no, matter of fact, let's not say blunt. Blunt is pejorative. Matter of fact, uh, frequently asked questions that you're actually answering. And I think I think it's I when I saw it, when I saw you start that I was very excited about it. And, and I know I clicked like, but I don't know if I chimed in to the full extent that I was happy about it because it really needed to happen. Thank you. Well, that's that's the spirit of the YouTube show going forward is as we start to talk to more and more professionals. I mean, the, Mark Wade has this joke that I think is 100%, which is every time somebody breaks into comics, comics goes and patches that hole in the wall. Oh, yeah right? They stop you from doing the same thing over again. Yeah. Right. And so every pro, I mean, Billy has one of the greatest breaking in stories. I think mm -hmm. business has, you know, like, and Billy, you and I've never talked. I remember being at Malibu and people telling me about she number one, mm -hmm. how well it sold and how completely gobsmacked you were. Yeah. <laughs> And how you were just a dude <laughs> with a dream and you bought an ad and you got the orders. And like, that's one of the great success stories in the history of comics, but nobody else ever, you know, broke in like that. And so my hope is, is like you, if I do one of these a week, you know, next year, you're going to have 50 stories of breaking in. Yeah. People can listen and, and understand Everyone's unique. Everybody does it differently. And the business, when you break in, you know, Billy, when, when I was at Malibu and you were breaking in, the business was completely different. And so the business changes. And and Philip Sablick and I talk about, we think the business changes every two years. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and so you got to pay attention. The, the, the playing field is totally different. The rules are different. And so these stories are not meant to be literal of like, hey, the way that you need to break into comics is you need to go buy a previews ad and submit your book and your Billy Tucci tomorrow, right? It's more of look at the resourcefulness, look at the dedication, look at the desire to do the craft, look at, you know, talented people. Like I've been telling people to go watch the Todd documentary. Yeah. Todd McFarlane documentary. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dude, what? how many, like I would have given up on how many times he got rejected. Yeah. And by the way, they're rejecting Todd McFarlane. Yeah. <laughs> right. Now, admittedly, when you look at his work at that time, it was not as polished as what he becomes. Yeah. Right. So it, it wasn't just self evidently, you know, I think a better example, you know, Billy, your craft, when you broke in that first issue of she is a good looking book and that's why it got ordered. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. yeah. The, the thing too is that like I had um, submitted to Malibu and they actually, uh, for the, uh, Roland, Roland, Mann, Roland Mann had a pinup that he didn't use. Yeah, it was a yeah. cover. Yeah, yeah, it was a cover. <laughs> the, the protectors. I mean, I don't know if I was ready, but yeah. you know, um, and uh, and they never. I think used it was Ohm Ohm that Ohm that took your art around and said you should use this guy. 
Oh, did wow. he? And, and, well, Roland, Roland was the guy, and Roland was the guy that listened. It was in previews as the cover that was going to be, and it never came out. I'm like, oh, oh well. But the thing is, what I like what you're doing, Ross, is like somebody wants to write, you know, that question that how do I get to write Power Rangers? Right. Well, the thing is, you know what? Make your own Power Rangers. Make that book so successful that these publishers come to you then. And yep. ask, hey, would you like to do a, an issue of this? You know, it, it's it's absolutely the case. I mean, um, when I had, you know, I had done a few comics. I had been around the industry for a long time and people knew me. So when I walked into Jeff Marriott at ID, when he was editor in chief at IDW and pitched them on 24, because my attitude was, if you can do CSI, you can do 24. Mm -hmm. uh, they went and got the license for it. Yeah. But I had, I had a bit of a track record uh, and people knew me enough to get in there. Now, the quickest way in comics, this is where we're, we are bloody egalitarian. If you go do a great indie, indie, indie comic, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, whatever, and that's the only place you publish it, and you get a table at, I don't know, the Baltimore Comic Con, and they sit you next to Jim Shooter, and it's a good comic, you're immediately in the club. Billy and, you, Billy and I have had this discussion for years. If you do an indie film, you're not suddenly hanging out with Spielberg. Mm -hmm. Comics are very egalitarian this way, and once yeah. you've got a track record, many more things are possible. I'll tell you, we hired a guy, and here's how he got our attention. He did a 22-page comic as a writer. He went and he found his artist, and he kickstarted it. He published basically a one-shot. And then he went to my editor-in-chief, Matt Gagnon, was doing a panel. And after the panel, as Matt was heading to, to the door to head out. He stopped him and he said, hey, I really enjoyed the panel. Um, I really like Boom. And I wrote this comic and it's already been published, so I'm not submitting it to you, okay? And it's just an example of the work I do. And here's a copy if you want to read it. And I'll tell all the fans here a secret. Now, this is a real secret. This is, you should be able to exploit this, okay? As professionals, we all leave that convention and we go to the airport and we've got a stack of stuff Yeah. and we're trying to get rid of it. Right? <laughs> okay. You got this thing's written on this cocktail napkin and this thing over here and nice guy. And I got to do, and this guy gave me, you know, an overstreet price guide. Oh, I should hold on to that. Right. <laughs> And you're sorting through all the stuff that you've collected from the show, right? And for, for Jeff and I, there's always like that back issue, right? We've got mm -hmm. or two or three or four or 50. And then what happened with my editor-in-chief is he's sitting there at the airport and he's like, oh, here's this kickstarted one shot. It's not a graphic novel. It's not a 12-issue series. It doesn't require any commitment. I've got five minutes before I get on the plane. And... I'll take a look at this. It's not a submission. The guy doesn't want to do the series. He's This is one and done. It's already over, right? And so he just sat there and read it and was like, ah, this guy's good. And he came, he kept it, hopped on the plane. And when he got back, he was like, ah, oh, you know, this kid came up to me and he has the thing and it's pretty cool. So check it out. And I read it. And I was like, yeah, let's give him a shot. So there's... A whole pile of secrets. There's like 15 yeah. secrets embedded in that that you can use to. Absolutely. Hey, Niall, could we put up? Eddie Winkler has a, a, yep. a super I'm chat there. That super chat. I want to get Ross's reaction to, and I've got go. one after he speaks. Yeah, Eddie Winkler, a passion in hard work sells itself always. Eventually, the right buyer will find it. Everybody wants passion, right? We we need it as people. We need, you know, can you imagine going through your life without seeing any passion in the world? Like we're attracted to it and yeah. we need optimism and, and we also believe in hard work. You know, everyone has the fantasy of the lottery ticket, right? But the truth of the matter is, is we respect hard work yeah. because we want to be those people. Even if we're not, we see, oh, that guy did the work. Look at that. He's succeeding. You know what? Good on him. I'm, I'm going to go home tonight and maybe I'm not going to sit on the couch and drink beer and screw around. Maybe I'm going to do my own thing. Mm -hmm. You know, 
So and it's contagious, like, though. Passion and enthusiasm yep. is totally and, contagious. Oh yeah, especially if you have a great group of, of fellow creators too. It's like you, you kind of help motivate each other. You know, one kind of going down. Yeah. One of the things that one of the things that the passion has to include is the hunger to get better. Yeah. Yes. And it's not just enough that it's just I, just, I just want to tweak this definition a little. It's not enough just to be passionate. That's that can get everybody excited. Everything Ross said about this is absolutely true. Yeah. But to sustain it, you've got to be, you've got to get hungry to get better. Well, that's when, like a when, true when, fire. when I first started hanging out with Billy and he'd be drawing a page of she and he'd say something like, oh, that's not good. And he'd start over or he'd get rid of a whole panel or several panels and do it over. At first, I didn't get it because I thought, well, you've already made it. Why aren't you doing your damn comic? And, he, and I was, oh, he is doing his damn comic. When I started working on Zombie Proof and, and Ross tells me, it's a really good idea, but when do we see some actual zombie proofing? I've never forgotten it, man. <laughs> You're always in my special thanks. And he, I mean, it's years between books, but you know, yeah. uh and, and, it, and it's these the questions that you have to ask yourself to get better that's a part of the passion that's where part of the passion has to be focused enough of my rambling well you know if you're an artist and you know i'm probably not qualified to be giving art um advice on this uh on this live cast but the you know as an artist like if you're if you're schlepping your portfolio around the show if you go to four folks and they you know, they say they talk to you for 10 minutes each and each one spends two minutes on life drawing. Hey, you should draw from life. Hey, you need to do more life drawing. Hey, have you ever done any life drawing? It's like, you should listen. Absolutely. It's, yeah. it, it's hard to, you know, part of the artistic pain is, and this is another reason why writing is unattractive to me. Okay. <laughs> this is how I can turn down Keith Giffen of, a, of an opportunity to write is you know part of the artistic thing is you're 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 taking your heart and your soul and you're laying it out there and you're asking people to like it and they're not all going to like it mm. like there's just nothing that everyone likes right even avatar or you know fill in the blank what's the biggest blockbuster of all time i don't know anymore but there's detractors right yeah and so you know you got to be prepared for the fact that people are not going to like it and the thing that's really hard that will make you a professional is being able to hear criticism and understand what's actually legit and what you need to get better at. And you need to be tough skinned enough that you can take the rejection. You know, Absolutely. A lot of people quit. A lot of people quit when they get that stern criticism and they don't take that to fuel the passion. And, and, and that's and, where you, you have to have it in you. And the first and the one is fuel. Yeah, and not Niall, that's absolutely right. And the, the hardest thing is as a creator, whether you're a writer or any other craft, I think artists get it more than anybody else, but it really applies to everybody uh, who's working on the creative side, is this at some point you have to decide whether the you have to be hungry for the criticism that helps you. And you've got to blow off the criticism that is misguided. And that's yep. really hard, and, and you got to work to get to that point. Well, that's why I use the example of talking to four, getting four po portfolio reviews, right? Yeah. Because yeah. when you're talking to, you know, you're kind of crowdsourcing opinion, and you're pulling the threads that are in common out. So, you know, it's like it, it's getting a second opinion yeah. from the doctor. I, right. right. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that's, I think that's, you know, Look, yeah, somebody thinks even, I'm correct. Isn't that cool? <laughs> yeah, JC, correct. Complacency has no place in creative works. If we don't want to get better, we don't want to succeed. Hey, I, Ross, speaking of success, I actually, I actually have a very specific question about Boom. From when you started, are there projects? Oh, no, let me say what. Let me say no, there are projects. It's you're, you're a human being. What projects didn't work out as well as you thought they would? Ooh, that's a good question, Jeff. It's a great question. Yeah. Wow. Well, well, and then well. we'll follow it up with Blevins' question after yeah. this one. Yeah. Well, well, well. Let's see. Um, you know, uh, you know, 
the hard part of this question is if I start to say certain projects, it's injurious to the creative people that did them. Mm. Mm. Well, okay. Let's give a caveat here. Let's say some of it's timing. Some of it, the the Hollywood phrase, if it didn't find its audience, Dave uh, Overch just had a, a comment about that a minute ago. Right. Um, uh, there are any number of things, but from the bottom line perspective, well, well, like, we thought would be more successful. Well, what here? So here's a fun anecdote that's actually timely. So um, we did Warhammer comics. Mm -hmm. Okay, and. One of the things that I'm still proud of with the Warhammer comics is that at um, Games Workshop, they had this thing called the Wall of Awesome. And what this was, was this was artwork being generated either by licensors or internal at the company that they would put up as inspiration. So you have to remember, at Games Workshop, they design their own miniatures. And so they're doing paintings and illustrations and designs, and then they're trying to rein that into a point where you could actually sculpt it and not just sculpt it, that you could give specifications that it could be reproduced like an army, right? Which is really awesome. hard to do. Mm -hmm. And so we would make the wall of awesome all the time with our comics and games workshop, which generally speaking, the, the folks that work there are tough. Like I got no problem with it. That is not a complaint. Like I, you can be tough on me all day long. Okay. She'll sure. never be as tough on me as my dad was. All right. Mm. So you'd be tough on me. Cool. But they were the, the fact that those guys were so tough and we made the wall of awesome was like a huge professional accomplishment for me. But the thing is, is what I was unprepared for. And by the way, let me back up for a second. The one of the guys that was writing our Warhammer comics was a guy named Dan Abnett. And mm -hmm comic book fans know Dan Abnett from doing Annihilation at Marvel and yep. he's been writing in comics for 30 years. Legion. Guardians of the Galaxy. Yep. The list is gigantic. Okay. Yeah. But what you don't know is he is the guy on Warhammer 40k. Like, you don't understand. He's the Frank Miller Alan Moore in one of Warhammer 40k. Okay. So we went out and got the guy to write the comics, okay? And we're doing the comics, and what we didn't know was that Games Workshop was looking at Games Workshop sales in comic shops. And if a comic shop was selling a lot of Games Workshop, what they would do is go open a Games Workshop-owned store across the street. Oh, Hey, look, you know, they're big. Yeah. 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 At the end of the day, do what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, but it was the wrong time yeah. for us, right? Which is we'd solicit the product through Diamond and retailers would come up to us and go, I love these miniatures. The comics that you're doing are awesome. And I absolutely do not want to support Games Workshop. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So that's a shame. What do you do? You know, you're on the wall of awesome. The artwork's there. You got Dan Abnett writing it. And, you know, Marvel's doing it now, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're like, you got a license that you knew at the end of the day was big enough that Marvel Comics thought it was worth their time. And you showed up at the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong retail cycle. So Yeah. Oh. Then on the other end of that spectrum, you know, uh, Brian Blevins asked, so what would be your top three dream license oh. to require that you have not been able to work out a deal on or may never be able to work out a deal for? Let's see. Well, the, the, I got I got to take one off my list because I'd spent – so if you, if you don't know who Kevin J. Anderson is, so Kevin uh, – wrote Star Wars novels, but he's most famous for writing the Dune novels with yes. uh, Brian Herbert. And so uh, when we got the Dune license, yes, oh. exactly. When we got the Dune license, uh, Kevin J. Anderson and I had a debate. I thought that I had been chasing that license for 10 years. And he mm -hmm. thought that I had been chasing that license for 12 years. <laughs> so um, that that's that's that is actually probably... 
I mean, I don't know that I've ever chased anything so passionately and fervently as Dune and not been able to get it. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, and I'm trying to think of other things. You know, we always wanted to do an outsider's graphic novel. And then S.E. Hinton went on Twitter and said, yes, Brian, yes. Essie Hinton went on Twitter and talked about how she'll never do a graphic novel version of The Outsiders because The Outsiders is the first book that a lot of people read. Mm -hmm. And she believes that she has a um, role to play as a gateway into reading. And that if she has a graphic novel version of that, she's worried that it would deter people from reading the novel. And she thinks it's important that they for whatever, you know, so, yeah. she'll never, so anyway. Yeah. The, uh, JC's computer crashed. Oh, no. <laughs> He's booting back up. Yeah. yeah, it was just perfect timing. You're talking about Dune and then that pops. But he sent me a message that his computer crashed. You've already had Ross, Ross, you've been on for, for over an hour already. And uh, the thing that, one of the questions I want to ask, and I'm sure you get this a lot, but how did the whole Berserker... Ah. Adventure begin to, to 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 that you have now you know the biggest Kickstarter comic in history. Um, I mean, just what a fantastic project and how you got you know you know Keanu Reeves is a superstar and it just seems like such a wonderful human being as well. Yes. Um, and just he's a badass, you know the whole thing, you know everything about him. Um, I love his shooting. You know he does it the 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 you know the three gun and all that and. Um, but how did how did something how did you pull that off? And well done, my friend. Thank I mean, you. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, we have a team that is dedicated to film and TV, and they are full time. Uh, five folks um, that you know. We have a Netflix first look TV deal, and we also have a. It was originally Fox, and then Disney bought Fox, and it's been changed into 20th Century is the name of the film entity that, that Disney owns going forward. And so um, through that, we do a lot of business with the agencies, CAA, William Morris, United mm -hmm. Talent, and we're known in town. And so um, we had, and you know, Booms made two movies, uh, features, and we've got a show going on Disney Plus that's based on uh, R.L. Stein's graphic novel with us, uh, Just Beyond, you know, the Goosebumps guy, R.L. Stein. Mm -hmm. So um, the agencies know who we are. And so we got, we literally got an incoming call, and it was Keanu Reeves wants to pitch you a comic book. <laughs> and, you know, I basically had the blessed position to be able to go sit on a couch and have Keanu stand in front of me and go, and the way he pitched it was, I just want to punch through dudes' chests. <laughs> and yet, yet, do you know what's really great about this project? I, I was talking about him, and, and Rosina asked me, why aren't you saying Kanunu anymore? Why are you saying his name correctly? Because I always said it wrong just to make oh, it okay. crazy. Oh. And I said, because he's a comic book guy now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he goes. <laughs> yep. Well, I'll tell you, man, about, about the comic book guy part. He pitched, you know, basically he's an immortal. Go, You know, I'm thinking he was born in Babylon, Mesopotamian, blah, blah, blah. Goes through a lot of the stuff. And it's about probably a three-hour session that first time. And he gets to the end and he goes, and let's get Raphael Grandpa to do the cover. Now, that means he met, he read Mesmo Delivery Service or Mesmo Delivery, sorry, Kiki Delivery Service, Mesmo Delivery. Um, and that means he's a real comic book fan, hmm. right? Yeah. And so yeah. what he's doing at that point is that's a, that's a check, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, are you on the same page with me? Yeah. This is yeah. who I see creatively, right? And are you down for this style? And I just thought it was such an elegant, smart way to make sure you were with the right people creatively. And 
you know, it is the hell of a thing to have Keanu Reeves tell you stories about buying the, you know, back in 1982, the Wolverine limited series by Chris Claremont and Frank Miller off the rack. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I remember where I was when I bought it. And so uh, it's a hell of a thing. And, um, you know, he, he loves comics. And when, when we sat down and sort of took him through the Kickstarter opportunity, you know, that it was an opportunity to get people that have never read comics before who had access to it with one click, you know, he was instantly on board because he has such a passion for comics and he was so excited that somebody would uh, have their first comic book read would be his, you know, he was just psyched about that. We, you know, we did the Kickstarter video and um, if you go to my Facebook, I have the screenshot for the banner above my profile is him saying comics are awesome. Nice. You know, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the things I wanted to, I want to not digress too much from this, but you made, and we'd all been looking for this, Ross, you, with your marketing for that campaign, you made crowdfunding not only palatable, but attractive to our retailers. Yeah. Where before it was yet another threat to them. Yeah. Well, well, I'll go, I'll go one deeper with you on this. Okay. So one of the things I did before we, when we, when it was coming together was that Philip Sablik made a list of 15 retailers that we think will have opinions. Okay. And you know who this right. is. <laughs> Well, this is this is the most outsp outspoken. The guys that have everyone's ear, right? Yeah. And so uh, I talked to my friend Card D'Angelo, who owns Earth Two Comics, who's one of the Will Eisner Spirit of Retailing Award, lives here in LA, very close with Car. And Car laid it out really well, which I think the thing that we did with Berserker was we're putting the comic, the individual issues, the singles in stores first and then we're collecting and we're selling it to the kickstarter audience okay and Carr said so often people will solicit the, the kickstarter graphic novel and then they'll take that graphic novel and they'll serialize it in the direct market after the kickstarter backers have gotten it and he said as a retailer what's hard for me to understand is how many like how's the Venn diagram work where it's like, because you sold directly to people on Kickstarter first, how many of those people would have bought it in my store, mm. but now they're not. And he's like, I get confused and I don't understand. He's like, you've switched that dynamic where I know when I'm going to order berserker number one, no one has read that con or had an opportunity to buy it. Right. Or, you know, buy it as the wrong expression is like they can pre-order it, but it's like, we're getting the comic first. And I think that's was like a dynamic shift, uh, in approach. And, you know, it's like people get confused. We, we live in a culture because of our smartphones where everything's done in three clicks. And so you don't, you just read headlines and you don't read the article and so people freak out and get upset. And, you know, here's the thing, man. Like, I, I'll just be as straightforward as I possibly can be about this. I'm from Texas, right? And the culture I was raised in and our approach is, I don't care, right? You know, it's like, I, I was the guy that played football in high school and I painted and I was an honor student. And... The, the kids that were in the painting class did not like me because I was a jock, right? And the jocks were mad at me because I was an honor student. And like, I've just been pissing people off yeah. with everything I've done for 40, 45 years. So, yeah, yeah. you know, and Why I stop now. Right, right. Well, I just don't, you know, it's coupled with that idea that we were talking about earlier, which is you just don't see what the boundaries are. Right. So I sit there and I go, why hasn't anybody done this before? Mm -hmm. And at that coupled with 
you know, I'm not trying to piss you off. I'm sorry you're upset, but I don't really care, right? Like, I, I'm I'm sorry. Like, I'm not trying to antagonize you, you know, because I, I, I think one of the things I would like to say to the the Kickstarter sort of community that that there were some people that did get upset that we were kickstarting such a big dude like Keanu. Yeah. And when I looked at it, they were worried that the Keanu Kickstarter would take money away from them. And I just don't fundamentally think that's true. And well, yeah, you have you have to believe you have to believe that there's only a certain a pie finite pool, right? And, and I mean, we're pulling people in that read People that, magazine that have yeah, never, never been on comic in their life. They've yeah, never been on Kickstarter true. before. They've yeah. never been in comic shops before. They've never got comics before. That's to me. That's why this is this is comic book gold. What you're doing, yeah. and and I think it's I think it's I understand their fear. I'm a I'm I'm a small Kickstarter creator. I get it. I just don't believe it's true. Right. Well, and, and I think, you know, yeah, it comes back to, is it articulated? And I think Keanu in or out of the Kickstarter comic book market, I just don't think that that, I would love to see if somebody has the statistics and can do the data scraping, but I just don't see how there's a firmly articulated audience that spends exactly the same amount of money every month on Kickstarter on comics. I just don't think that's true. There's and I think it's project specific and I think it's depends upon the creator and how they're able to reach out to people and create. Well, it's like a boutique. People. It's almost like a boutique. You know, you go on and, and you peruse Indiegogo, you peruse Kickstarter, you, you see projects you like, you get the recommendations. It's not like a, it's more like going into the comic shop and just browsing and then be like, Oh, you know, I'll check this out. I'll check out that out. Cause like you said, it is project specific, but here, uh, the Mopsy, a long time, uh, a watcher of the show, that's a kind of a good question, and it's kind of a little bit of a thought I had, though. Have you gotten kickback from some of the backers that may be a little upset that, you know, issues are going to come out before they get their crowdfunded uh, backing level? We were 100% clear. We wrote that mm -hmm. Kickstarter within an inch of its life. I can't mm -hmm. tell you how many drafts we went through to make sure that everybody got warned up front. So if people are just told them this is the deal, this is what it is. And there's yeah. a, there's a great there's a great part of this for me that is thinking about your marketing hat, and I, I, I get it. See, it's like a lot of creative people don't get excited about the marketing side of it. You and I do, Russ. And the 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 thing about it is for this for me is when they get their first volume, knowing that two more are coming. Mm -hmm. Man, I think some of them are going to go by the individual issues. They get to see Garney art. They get to see uh, Keanu's comic here. Well, I, they got a feeling that, that you're going to sell more of the second and third miniseries print wise than you're going to than than your than than would otherwise indicate. Well, here's the evil plan. Okay, and 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 uh, we've talked about this verbatim online, so it's not a secret. It's there if you want to go read it. Okay, is when the campaign's over, we have the emails, mm -hmm. right? And when the book gets shipped to the direct market, the Monday before the Wednesday, we're going to send a blast out and we're going to say, hey, just so you don't get shocked, just like we always said, the first issue, or maybe in parlance for non-comic book readers, the first chapter mm -hmm. is in the stores. Now, if you don't want to wait, like your book's on time, we're making the book, everything's cool, right? If you don't want to wait, you can go to the comic shop, okay? Now, I will tell you, I have had retailers contact me on social media and tell me they're getting pre-orders from people that have never read a comic book before that were driven to comic shops because of the Kickstarter campaign. Mm -hmm. okay? We've seen this so we're using it as a tool to do that. We, we've yeah. seen breakout books that have done this Co books that originate in comics such as sandman books that originate on television such as the x-files people forget how hot that book was in mm -hmm. bringing female readers into comic shops the first year the first year that that book was out charlie adler stefan petruca moran kim yep. and, and 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 it was great like that we see it you know with licensed comics for um uh or when comics generate the property like winona earp mm -hmm. yep 
Yep. It's phenomenal stuff. Yep. Well, like that, Adventure Time. Adventure Time. We saw a lot of people going into shops. Well, yeah. Very good. Yep. Well, that's what's great because uh, you know, like you're saying, you, you know, as a small indie creator, when you see you know a book of that nature come in, right, Berserker and stuff like that, and it's doing well, and all it does is it's like, oh wow, this is great because you are what they what you can't deny is that what you guys have done is brought that audience in. You brought the non comic book readers, or you just maybe you reintroduce comic to fans that may have walked away from the hobby for a while, you know, of reading. But what's great, it's like you know when I discover something new, I kind of get into it, right. You know, even if it's like a YouTube thing, right? I accidentally see like an RC jet. I'm like, holy crap, you can actually have an RC jet with real jet engine. Next thing you know, I'm exploring the heck out of it. That's what happens, right? You see yep. something like a little bit and you want to see more. So now, not only are they backing Berserker, but then they might be backing, you know, John, you know, Indie John stuff here, who's, you know, going to do a five, $6,000 campaign. But now he just got another new fan because someone just saw a project that they were like, wow, this looks cool. Let me check it out. So yeah, it legit legitimizes what you're doing. It's not hurting the, the retailers because like you said, and it's in there. It's in there verbatim. It's there how this is set up, how people are going to get it. And the people read it and many, many people backed it. And the cool thing is that you have Keanu Reeves doing it. And Keanu Reeves is a real comic book fan. Like it's not like either you're like someone's using Keanu's name. Like, no, Keanu had a huge part in creating this. I mean, like you just said, he gave you the pitch. You know, it wasn't someone saying, hey, let's do this with Keanu when you might have a phone call or two with him. You know, we know a couple of the books that kind of went that way. This is like really like a, a big celebrity who's actually known to be an extremely great person who's actually seems to put his heart and soul into this actual book. I mean, you can't yeah, beat I, that. That's freaking awesome. I have an abundance mentality. I do not have a scarcity mentality. Mm -hmm. So I believe that the way that the world works, and maybe I'm dead wrong, but the, I think in comic shops, if Marvel had the most exciting books and DC had the most exciting books and mm -hmm. Image had the most exciting books and IDW and Dark Horse and Vault and, 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 that the place is rocking if that happens. And we've all experienced on Wednesdays where you're like, ah, do I really need to get to the shop this Wednesday or could I wait till Saturday when I'm doing the dry cleaning or whatever it is? Yeah. And then we've all experienced the OMG, I cannot wait to get to the shop because I got to get this and I got to get that and I got to get this and I got to get that. And so I think the energy, if you bring the thunder, it's always good, right? I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't agree more. People, uh, I've had this talk with people who are starting to tell me about event fatigue. And I, and I asked them, who is tired of great events? Mm -hmm. Nobody's tired of great novels. Nobody's tired of great movies. Nobody's tired of great television. Nobody's tired of great comics. Yep. yep. Great yeah. is freaking phenomenal. Yep. Because yep. it gets people excited. Just because things haven't been great, I'll, I'll concede that all day. Right. But, mm -hmm. but nobody's tired of the existence of a great comic book. Yep. Speaking of which. Nobody said, oh, it, hey, hey, thank you. <laughs> you Nobody go. said, oh, it's a Stan and Jack comic? I don't want to read that. Yep. Yeah, it, it, exactly. Hey, I want to I ask, you know, we've had a lot of questions about licensed comics, and I realize I'm sort of jumping off the thread we were on just now. But, man, I was a Planet of the Apes guy before I was a comic book guy. And you guys not only produced great new Planet of the Apes comics, as you know, I literally reviewed every single issue of Daryl Gregory's run. Thank you. Um, and I'd still be doing it if you guys were still publishing. Uh, and you also did great archives of the Marvel stuff. Thank you. Which I, I you know, as a, as a fan, I, first off, editorially, I really appreciate you pulling it off. Secondly, uh, I love having them like right under the shelf, right under Dr. Doom behind me is is all the boom plan of the apes stuff you know it's a good day when mike mignola emails you and goes hey can i get a volume one from you <laughs> wow that's like, great I got you, mike i got you that's really yeah. that's really good so was that was that a good relationship for you guys oh it was great it was absolutely terrific and look you know this is where dave olbrich will pop back up because the inspiration for me with Planet of the Apes was Malibu. Sure. You know? So Malibu 
the 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 best selling independent comic book of all time was Planet of the Apes number one by Malibu. Is that and Charles Charles Marshall that was the writer of that? Is I that think right? that's right. Yeah, it right. was really weird. He was on the flight when Rosina and I went to my first San Diego in ninety four, which is where I met Billy. Wow. That's amazing. And so I think it was the best selling num independent number one of all time until Aliens versus Predator by Dark Horse. So it was like that little late eighties to early nineties shift. And so I remembered that and, you know, grand irony was I was at the licensing show and I went up to Fox and I said, um, I want to license Planet of the Apes. And they were like, what? <laughs> Cause it was like after the Tim Burton movie. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. Maybe people like it, maybe people don't, but I, they didn't see no, the, people were not, into licensing for Planet of the Apes at that point. Mm -hmm. And I kind of had to talk them into it. You know, yeah. it did. Okay. This is, this is just too self-referential and I apologize for that, but it did get you guys on the cover of the overstreet. Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. uh, what a great book cover that is too. And, and Ryan, I asked Ryan to do this cover. He said yes. And then he had a number of things go wrong and he, you know, he had a number of things going on and DC deadlines and stuff like that. And I almost pulled the plug on it. And thank you for holding fast. And, and I asked him if he could, I said, I'd really like it if he could fit at least four of the movies in there, mm -hmm. the original five. Wow. And he got all five wow. and it, it is, it's easily, you know, I, I, still have plenty of other covers to recruit and artists to talk to. So uh, I won't say it's my definitive favorite, but it is one of our greatest covers in, in my estimation. He just kicked ass Absolutely. on it. Absolutely. And, and I, and I, every time I look at it, I think it's a movie poster. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, and that's, and, and honestly, it's because you guys were doing such kick-ass work on it. And, and I, I'm gushing like a fanboy, but so be it. Thank you. Well, you, you'll be highly entertained that I've been known to stand in the editorial bullpen and say to the editors, you do not understand in your franchise-rich world that you live in that this was before Star Trek, or I guess contemporaneous with Star Trek, uh, but Star Trek wasn't merchandised. And this was an era that was pre-Star Wars and post-Twilight yeah. Zone. Twilight Zone wasn't nerdy enough to really be merchandised. Yeah. And so this was a series of films, a cartoon, a TV show, right? And was Trading action. Cards. Yep. Trading. Oh, coloring books. I mean, er everything they had. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's 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 one of the original, you know, nerding out. I'd call it the Ur, the UR. <laughs> it's the Ur franchise, right? It's the original. Yeah. Uh, science fiction, you know, comic booky, nerdy franchise, and of course, you know, the Marvel comic with uh, the great Mike Plug and Doug Minch. So, um, you know, they were, and and it's just, it's very difficult to explain to folks that, like, like what would happen is, like, I'm walking through editorial, and they'll make a Star Trek reference from the original series, and I'll stop and correct them, and they'll be like, "We didn't know that you were a Star Trek fan," and I'm like, "You'll understand, like, every nerd was a Star Trek fan." And every nerd was a Planet of the Apes fan because you didn't have anything else. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What else were you going to do? Like, this is before Battlestar Galactica. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So it's like, you know, that that's sort of one of those original headwater franchises that really, I think, changed the way studios thought about how film and TV worked. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think you're I think you're right. And I think it it wasn't the people at the studios in those days. It was it was the fans who grew up and became professionals that understood the roadmap that had been created there. Oh yeah. I mean, you, yeah. Look, at no. the, you look at the original Planet of the Apes, they didn't want to make any of those sequels. Yeah. Nope. Right. They lowered, they lowered the budget every time. Yes. Right. right. We'll do it if you make it for this. Yeah. Right. It, it, it's why, it's why the story behind escape from the Planet of the Apes and how Arthur P. Jacobs reacted and said, okay, let's set it in the 1970s. Yeah. And on Earth, and yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden he takes the disadvantage and makes it an advantage. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it was great stuff. Not brilliant. Not brilliant. Yeah. 
All right. So, so at, any, at any rate, yeah. I've I tried up enough of this talk with yeah. Planet of the Apes, but I want to say thank you publicly, yeah. Ross. So yeah. thank you, sir. And, and, and Ross, we, we've taken plenty of your time. Yeah. Um, I know we, we scheduled for about an hour with you, and now we've gone 30 minutes over, so I apologize for that. No uh, there's just, just uh, one thing I do want to bring up, and this is the reason why I wanted to have you on the show. Uh, Jeff Pearson puts a com uh, has posted a comment. Nobody is tired of good books, but guess what? There are almost zero exciting books out there, and the big two with their behavior drove me out of the comic shops. But this is, you know, everyone talks about the big two, but there's so many other great publishers out there that are really thriving and doing some amazing things, getting some really great original content out there, and also getting the licenses for some of, you know, for my generation is very nostalgic, and it's very, very well done. Example, Power Rangers, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, things of that nature. I mean, you guys really should, you know, the big two is great, right? But there's there's great publishing houses out there uh, that are producing some amazing comic books, well-written, well-drawn. And I have to say, Ross, seeing, you know, I feel like Boom has been booming, literally. Thank you. Like, it seems like it went from, oh, you know, there's a Boom comic system, that to see more in the news, this, that, Netflix, this, Keanu, boom, 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 boom. Power Rangers. Really, I feel like when Power Rangers hit, maybe it's because it's nostalgic for me. Um, just uh, just really, like, I started seeing a lot of stuff. I started uh, getting more involved with the books you're publishing. And Thank I you. have to give you kudos, man. You guys are killing it. Yeah, you really are. It's such great stuff you're putting out there. And I want people to open their eyes. You know, Marvel and DC are great, but you've got, and I'll throw IDW out there because my other nostalgic uh, uh, IP and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I mean, another nostalgic property coming out that's very well done. And there's so many other publishers out there, guys. Make sure to to, to discover everything. Here's, there's a lot here's out there. And you guys are doing crowdfunding too, which is great. I mean, it's just, it's a different ball game. I feel like uh, Boom's adapting very well with the times. Thank yeah. you. Well, the uh, we have a series out right now that's really building called Something is Killing the Children. Mm -hmm. And we had, uh, Billy, you're going to, I'm, I'm going to especially clock your reactions as I kick out some of these stats. Okay. Yeah. So the first issue sold over 50,000 copies. And then uh, the 11th issue outsold that. Wow. Well done. You see, and, and, and that's that's what it is, is because and, and going back from the berserker of Zed Keanu's pitch to you was I want a comic or, you know, I, I want to be in a comic or I want to write a comic or I want to read a comic or see a comic where someone's punching someone through the chest. There are so <laughs> many comics now where you have 22 pages of story and of those 22 pages of story or 20 pages of stories, 19 of them are people sitting around a conference table talking. You know, let's get, I mean, it, it, comics were supposed to be escapism, action, you know, fun, you know, intrigue, thrillers, Adventure. mysteries, you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, I, ancient I, violence, you know, have fun, have at it. I mean, look at the title alone, Someone is Killing the Children. <laughs> yeah, I want to read that, you know? Hey, there's a great question from TJ here. You want yeah, to get just that? Popped up. Yeah, this just popped yeah. up. So any more Goldie Vance from Hope ah, Larson? You know, I would really love to do some more Goldie Vance from Hope Larson. Hope is a genius, and Goldie Vance is delightful, but not right now. Now, um, that's something we're developing as a movie uh, that's in development at 20th Century. So, you know, if the if the if if you knew what I knew, which is that there are some very promising developments – um, if that went into production, it would be a great time to make more Goldie Vance. So that's uh, in particular, I just want to talk about Goldie for a second because the pitch on Goldie is it's a girl's comic. Okay. And the idea is Goldie is like a Nancy Drew investigator, but she's like Eloise. She lives in a hotel. And it's like girl catnip, right? Because it's like, what if Nancy Drew lived in a hotel? Yeah. Like, <laughs> and I'm like done. And of course she's sassy and she her her milieu is like a retro sixties hipster. It's really fun. Far out. I've got a, I've got a I want to relate a, a lumberjane story to you. Uh, a librarian friend of mine that I've known for, for since high school uh, was uh, editing a book for me. And when she gave me the manuscript back, it was in a lumberjane's tote bag that she got at a librarian's conference. I probably handed that to her. Yes. <laughs> and I, I thought of you immediately and I thought, wow, this is really cool. And I probably should return that bag to her because like, I'm done with the manuscript. Uh, but uh, I might not. 
I, I will tell you the librarians of the world you picture in some sort of mousy uh, sort of 1950s stereotype, and I'll tell you who they are. They are tattooed Gen X tough chicks <laughs> from an alternative culture, and they are all Lumberjanes fans. They're all Lumberjanes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They love the Lumberjanes. So, um, you know, that's a thing we just put together with HBO Max as an animated show, and it looks uh, very promising. And we've oh, got nice. Noel Stevenson, who's a co-creator. She is um, running the show. She she ran She-Ra uh, for Netflix, which was a big hit. So we're excited about that. That has great potential. But yes, um, show up with some Lumberjanes tote bags at American Library Association Conference, and you will find yourself at the bottom of the dog pile of librarians. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. So... As Niall said, we've we've gone oh, like slightly over our hour. Um, anything else you've got on the horizon that you want to make sure everybody anything knows exciting about? to share? Yeah. Well, well, well. I don't want to blow any marketing announcements uh, because I will hear about it from my team later. Um, but uh, we just had Power Rangers uh, number one and Mighty Morphin number one come out and hit shops these past two weeks, and that's a huge release for us. And we've got our slate all lined up for next year. And Berserker is going to be one of the big ones that kicks off the year um, with uh, a really exciting creative team. Matt Kent is writing that um, with Keanu. And um, I think we're going to have a lot of uh, fun uh, further things to reveal with, um, with uh, Berserker. There's going to be some, we did some video for Kickstarter, but we didn't, uh, uh, the, all of the videos, not for Kickstarter, some of the videos for comic book fans. So uh, you'll, get, you'll get more Keanu Reeves talking about Berserker. And um, just, you know, I hope everybody checks out my crazy experiment of talking too long and too detailed with comic book creators about how do they make comics and what influenced them on my YouTube channel. And swing by and, you know, if you think it sucks, tell me, you know, I got a thick skin. And, uh, you know, I should, I, I'm, I'm telling creators to listen uh, to criticism. I should be able to listen to some criticism on my own. Niall, are we putting the, the link to that in the in the uh, comments? Oh, yeah, we've already shared. Yeah, 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 the link's okay, going it's been up there for sure. Your Instagram Excellent. link, YouTube, all Thank that you. stuff's been going through Excellent. the Boom Studio uh, website. Yeah, definitely check them out. I've caught a couple of them. And really, I mean, getting into comics, I mean, a lot of people ask questions. How do I publish? How do I do this? I mean, it's actually fairly simple especially nowadays with stuff's there but you uh, your videos are great because you kind of you give the actual advice you know as a publisher like really like you Thank know you. if you want to do something go this route you know it's not you know you kind of have to work your way up do your own book make it your own you know things of that nature um instead of just hey how do i get this to you how do i get this to you your advice is very uh you explain it well it's well said it, you know, no one's going to take offense to it because again it's very well said and uh, mm -hmm. i say keep it up keep it up because i get i get messages all the time i know i'm sure billy and and jc do too like hey how do i publish a comic how do i do this and oh like, yeah well, just do very it. simple yeah. just do it <laughs> write your script get, get it drawn you know find a printer get it printed very and simple there you go it's very very simple it's like and three, yeah, especially steps. now with the internet and if you have you know <laughs> someone like you know like someone a leader an industry leader like ross giving his yeah. time to check it out check out yeah. his, his his channel for sure i, I think so billy what sure. do you have coming up oh um we are closing uh she return of the warrior tomorrow Woo! Uh, yeah and we're gonna yeah. have my my darling wife deborah uh i think 58 people bought her a drink 58 <laughs> she, drinks she has to drink she, tomorrow, said, she said she's gonna take 50 sips <laughs> she's got her I, I look like forward that. to watching that yeah, so that'll be fun. Well, I'm gonna invite you on, so please come in, and uh, I will, I'm gonna put it out there to a bunch of our friends and some of the backers and all the join Debbie, and we'll get her on for 45 minutes to an hour. I'll, I'll light the fire downstairs in the foyer and let her sit over there, and let's get her, you know, loaded, which I think would be a lot of fun, and <laughs> and just ask her questions about the fulfillment because God love her, we had 3,700 backers, and I think she's down to like 10 left. Good for and of three right. of those are commissions I owe, which I will finish over the weekend and next week. They'll all be done. But uh, And then next Thursday, we launch She Haikyo 
on Indiegogo, exclusively on Indiegogo. So that is the, the sequel to The Return of the Warrior. And then Monday night, Old Bean, I hope you will be joining us. You know I will. We have writing she. Uh, so it's going to have uh, myself, you, of course, uh, Gary Cohn, and Stephen Peros uh, to talk about, you know, the multi-Eisner Award, uh, you know, nominee, four-time Eisner loser, she. Uh, and how, uh, and, and just about the writer talking about the duality of the character, how Japanese history and Japanese mythology has played a part in 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 the character, and I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. It's gonna be, a, it's gonna be I, a and of course, it gives me yeah. one more chance to use my favorite quote from you ever. Okay, I don't draw nine panel pages. Oh, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> my reply was, "You do now." Yeah, exactly. Uh, Niall, well, what about you? Nine now? panel page. What do you have no, going well, on now? Well, this wraps up our interviews yeah. for the week. But we'll be kicking off next week. Next week with a good friend, and uh, glad he's coming back. Now we got Kevin Eastman coming back on the show. Yeah, we'll be kicking off so next good. week for us. We're going to be talking some Last Ronin. See what's going on with Drawing Blood, and uh, you know maybe have a beer or two on the right. on the stream with us. Yeah, Ross, did you see the Last Ronin? Did you did you see it? Absolutely, oh. I have my copy. Yep, absolutely. I love Kevin. Kevin is just the best. Please tell him. Please give him my best. What a great dude. I could not be more excited for the turtle renaissance that's going on. Yeah. It, was, it was pretty cool before last Ronin. And now you realize that, you know, what did they sell? 130,000 of those. And that's just, and I mean, that's just exciting for comics. It goes back to what you're yeah. saying. It's yeah. not that somebody isn't going to suddenly, you know, is going to suddenly go, oh, I'm not going to buy Marvel because of that. They're going to buy great yeah. books and they're going to get more excited about that. Me yeah. and this comic... We we're from the same year, all right. Ooh. We both debuted the same year on this planet. Nile, yes. where do you live? Where do you live? <laughs> uh, I live in good old Connecticut. Son of a. Right. And right uh, what, what, I got. That's right. I took Joy Wolf to the prom that year. When when do you go on vacation? Yeah. <laughs> He's got three and, uh, of them, Ross. I do have three of them. I have a first, a second, and a third printing. Um, yeah, the second and third stay on the desk right here, displayed at all times. And then in the vault, which is an old wine cellar I have, but it's the old one, uh, we we uh, keep all the comics in there. But uh, oh, I got to tell you, comics are in the vault. Comics are in the vault. Lock which on is away. in the basement, Ross. Which is in the, the basement. The I'll code you is. You fly in, I'll pick you up, and we'll go there. <laughs> done and done. And I will leave you in the car <laughs> with the motor running. So my thing of what's going on, Overstreet at 50. Nice. Five decades of the Overstreet comic book price guide. Great. Very job. happy with this book. It's a history of the guide. Uh, it is my 336 page thank you note to Bob for everything that he's done over the last 50 years for our industry. And uh, other than that, um, Still working on my pilot with Roddenberry and got McCandless and Company crime scenes on Indiegogo and on Kickstarter. Right now, yeah. that's right. And I had missed right on Indiegogo. We're funded on Kickstarter, right? We're funded on Kickstarter. We are funded on Kickstarter. It a matter of fact, it was the fastest I ever got funded on Kickstarter. Yeah. I mean, it's a crime fastest comic. Ever? Fastest Top. ever teen sensation. Teen sensation. Um, fastest ever. It is, it no, is I, uh, it, I it's a Pardon? I have to say, Billy, if you're a teen sensation, yes. you're looking a little rough for a teenager. Just a little rough, man. Just All a right. little rough. Just, just saying. And by the way, uh, Jeff, because I think this is the yak yak um, the uh, do you, uh, it sounds like you put the fun in funded. No. Yeah, and on, honestly, honestly, uh, it, it usually usually I'm busy putting the the funk in dysfunction, but in this case. <laughs> In this case, it was it was really funny. The Kickstarter, I didn't realize on Indiegogo that you couldn't add shipping destinations after the fact. Mm. And I had some uh, Stargate fans uh, from my time writing Stargate comics that were in the UK, and they wanted to add. And I thought, sure, I'll just add it. And I had to build a whole Kickstarter <laughs> because I screwed up on Indiegogo. And, in, and it turns around that it, the Kickstarter did much better so far. Excellent. Congrats. Excellent. All right. So, all right, well, Thank you, everyone. Well, also, well, your New York so Comic much. Con, uh, if I may, real quick, your New York Comic Con books that everyone ordered, uh, they're all printed. They're all here. Debbie's shipping them out next week. Out a she whole new over, door. She, out of a whole other door. So, Ross, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. This was thank fantastic. It was so, yeah, so, was uh, so educational, inspiring. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, nah, you want to tell him that, you know, tell him, tell him how we feel about him and whenever he wants to come well, on. Uh, very inspiring. I really appreciate you coming. I know it's taken a, a little while, you know, you had a lot going on. So we definitely appreciate you actually reaching Thank back out to me to get on. And we hope you'll, uh, you know, we hope you had a good time and we hope you'd join us again uh, to chat on Pop XP. And uh, good luck with everything. Keep us in the loop. You know, we'd love to have you on if you get some other campaigns going, anything you want to promote. We'd love to have you on to help uh, anything we do to help support Boom Studios. Thank hey, you very much. Really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, re real quick, Robert Frank, if, uh, uh, just real quick. We actually have a perk where you can be drawn in as a police officer, uh, Robert, in, in Shi Haikyo next week. <laughs> That's one of the uh, the little likeness. And you get All a right. badge and a gun and everything. <laughs> Ross, thank, thank you, Rob, you so much. And thank, thank you to our Ross, wonderful Ross, It was really, uh, chat. Really, great, really great to see you, Ross, and, and enjoyed the conversation a whole lot. I, I think other people did, too. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and congratulations on all your well-deserved success. Thank you so very much. It's great to see one of the good guys kicking ass. It's awesome. I, I really appreciate it. Billy, we're going to go drinking with Garth in New York. And, Indeed. Uh, and that happens. We'll, Is we'll Jimmy see. invited to that one or no? Uh, I, I don't show think, up. I don't think it happens unless Jimmy is there, right? It's true. Yeah, probably, you know, yeah, Jimmy it's, like, organized. it's like Pixar. It didn't happen. It's like Jimmy Pomiati or it didn't happen. That's right. That's true. All right, guys. <laughs> Thank All you. right, everyone. Thank you so Thank much. You. Everyone have a great night. Uh, join us tomorrow night as Billy gets his wife drunk. And uh, have a great weekend otherwise. And we will see you all Tuesday with Kevin Eastman. Thanks, Ross. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one, JC. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us on Pop XP. If you haven't already, make sure to click that subscribe button and also click the bell for notifications when we go live and we upload some awesome new content. Also, don't forget to head on over to Twitter and follow us at the Pop XP and over on Instagram at the Pop XP. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you soon.